Britain. To my left, Graham Watson. Hello. You're an MEP from the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. You're also the uh, president of the European Liberal Democrats and Reform Party. You are a staunch supporter of the European Union. You regard Europe as a solution, not as a problem. Also on this set, Nigel Farage. Hello. Uh, you are the uh, leader of UKIP, the UK Independence Party. You're a staunch uh, uh, Eurosceptic. That's how you are portrayed, at least here in Strasbourg. You're also an MEP here uh, in Brussels and Strasbourg. And I'd like to start our talk show with one simple question. Europe is facing a, uh, a very deep crisis, economic, financial, but some say also uh, almost existential crisis. I'd like to start with you, Mr. Farage. In this crisis, do you think that we need more European integration or we need disintegration? Well, Oscar Wilde said many years ago that the definition of madness was to, to go on repeating the same mistakes and expecting a different result. And, and what we've got here um, is a project, the Euro particularly, uh, which many of us warned going back 12 or 13 years, and I said it again and again and again, it will not work. What was perfectly obvious was that you had an optimal currency zone in the north of Europe, that Germany and its neighbouring countries just about France as well, I think, could have fitted together in an economic and monetary union. Forget the politics, just purely talk for the moment the economics. But from the start it was obvious that Greece, Spain, Portugal and probably Italy as well were not suited to joining the euro. We've warned about it. It's led to a catastrophe. Um, I'm afraid if we talk, talk about the human cost of this and what's going on in the Mediterranean, the situation is bad. And I would say if we were good Europeans... Uh, what we should be doing is helping those countries to re-establish their own currencies and get back on their own two feet. I would Mr. argue, Wilson. on the contrary, that had we not had the euro, our economies would have been knocked for six by the financial crisis in 2008. It was only the creation of the European Central Bank and the ability of the European Central Bank to inject more than 100 billion euros onto the market every night for three or four nights during that crucial week that actually kept Europe and indeed the global financial system a float. And yes, we, there are problems. Greece is technically bankrupt and it's about 2% of Europe's economy. But California is technically bankrupt and it's over 10% of the United States economy. But Actually, the euro is working remarkably well. But Ten years after its launch, it is still there. It was launched at parity with the dollar. It is trading considerably higher than the dollar. And there are still countries joining year by year. And that, to my mind, is a sign of success. But California is part of the United States of America, where they have a common history, they have a flag that they believe in, unlike the European one, which nobody believes in. You know, they are a state, they are a country. We haven't got a country in Europe. We've no. got a, we, we, we have an association of very, very differing countries. If you, if you look at the opinion polls, virtually nobody now says they're European first oh, no. and Dutch second, no. or European first and no. German second. No, I, mean, that's, I tell that's, you what, that's, if you and I left this studio now, the first hundred true. people we stopped in Almost Strasbourg, almost everybody you, you talked to, you would struggle to find that they are. You would struggle to find more, the more than the European flag flies in front of every well, uh, town in France. I think interestingly. Interestingly, the more of that flag we see, the more there is a reawakening, actually, of a sense of national identity. But back to this economic point no, of the no, euro. No, no, the ECB may have pumped money in when things were bad, but the problem was this, and I warned you of all, all of you of this at the time. When you take those southern Mediterranean countries, when they joined the euro, their interest rates literally halved overnight. And so we had a period, and Ireland was the same, we had a period of seven years. We don't need a lecture on economics, and, and reason, Nigel. We no, know why countries I don't want are in anybody. difficulty. What, what I know why these countries is, is are in taxpayers' money, and British but, taxpayers' money too, being, being squandered on something that from the outset... But, but Mr. Farage, let work. me ask you, you say uh, the euro is, is a problem. Now, Britain is not in the euro zone, Thank and Britain goodness. is in recession. France isn't in recession, Germany isn't in, rec in recession, so you can't can you, blame everything can you imagine, on, 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 on Can you euro. imagine if Britain had been in the euro, and we hadn't had one of the biggest depreciations in sterling since 2008 that we've had in the history, actually, of, 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 our, of our foreign exchange relations. If we hadn't had those things, then goodness only knows what state the UK would be in, because our, our last Labour government was as profligate as the Greek government.
Can you imagine what would have happened to the United Kingdom if we hadn't had the euro? It wasn't Gordon Brown who saved the world as the UK press trumpeted. It was actually Jean-Claude Trichet who saved the world by his interventions in, in the markets during that crucial week in 2008. Well, you're the and that's person. why the euro, not only, not only is the euro still going quite strong, there are new countries joining all the time, and it may even well be the case that the United Kingdom will be a member one day. You never know. Well, I really hope passionately that at the next European yeah. elections you put that to the electors in the southwest. Um, because that'll be the end of you here. Now, the Open Europe think tank has just, uh, just <coughs> had to accept this is a Eurosceptic think tank. They've just accepted that we're better off staying in. Well, of course we're they more do. Secure. Because they support, We've got more jobs. Because We've got they more support investment. the Conservative Party. Look, it, the, the opinion polls are very, very consistent. Very, very consistent. If you ask people, would you like to be a member of a simple free trade agreement with the European Union and not a member of the political EU? two-thirds of the British people say yes. If you ask, if you no ask, the, if you ask the start question, do you want to be in or out, yeah. and put it purely in those the terms, majority want to be well, in. actually, they vary, but let's yeah. say it's around 50%. It is not a third, uh, but certainly when it comes to having a trade relationship, but not politics, that's what we want. Now, figures, you seem to like figures. Uh, the European Commission has carried out a poll in Britain. It reveals that 82% of British respondents say they know little or absolutely nothing about mm. the European Union. Now, I'm a French journalist. My feeling when I open British papers <coughs> is that you have a lot of tabloids who are very biased and don't always what, tell... What, the mirror? Being pro the EU, you mean? Not only the mirror. I, I, oh, I the see. same one you, when you read stories... And the Financial do, Times is, that is, is pro. Is, do, and do the Guardian that is pro. Do you get that British, British voters are well informed? Because you are I think absolutely it's, it's right. Right. We're, we're, we're the only right. country, Most of the British the only country that has a balanced press. by people like Let's Rupert Murdoch it. and no. formerly Conrad Black no. who have an agenda to get Britain out of the European Union. And we know why Rupert Murdoch has that agenda. His father, who was a sheep farmer in Australia, suffered very badly with the end of imperial preference when the United Kingdom joined the European Union. And there is a clear agenda to denigrate the European Union and all its works, and quite possibly to pull Britain out you know, of it. You know, you it's agree. amazing you say this, but the, the BBC, uh, you know, have been the most nakedly, openly pro-EU organisation, you know, from the start of this debate, going back for half a century, and that's widely acknowledged by the BBC themselves, who, who, who have admitted they haven't given balance on this. We have The Guardian, absolutely solidly behind the European project. The Financial and Times, how many people solidly read the behind Guardian the European and the project. Financial the Independent, Times. the Daily Mirror, solidly behind the European project, and indeed ten years ago, the Express was solidly behind the European project. We also have, you're right, the Murdoch Press, the Telegraph, who are fiercely Eurosceptic. But I would say that actually in Britain what we have is a balanced media debate, unlike France, where frankly, um, if you look at French newspapers, Eurosceptics aren't even given a voice. Okay, that's an interesting point. Now, uh, Talking about the place of Britain in or outside Europe, now the uh, single market, has that been a positive force, uh, an asset Dreadful. for Britain or not? Dreadful. Knowing that 50% uh, of British exports go directly uh, to the Eurozone. Well, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Um, and that is that being trapped inside the customs union that is the single market, we are prohibited from making our own trade deals and alliances around the rest of the world. And because of that, you know, our, our government and our big business has been too Eurocentric in its Mr. thinking. Mr. Watson, your response, please. No, I, I don't agree at all. I mean, last time I did a similar program to this with Nigel, uh, he argued that not a single, and I quote you, Nigel, not a single British job depend on our trade with the European Union. I was wrong. I'm Yours sorry, would go and mine would go. Wrong. Yours and mine would go. Over three million that. jobs depend on our no, trade with the European the Union. This is the biggest And quite fallacy. possibly more uh, on the lock <laughs> If we were not part of, for example, the Airbus co consortium, Lovely. there would be many fewer jobs in my constituency uh, in the north of Bristol. If we were not trading oh. with uh, Belgium, a lot of the farmers in my area would not have anywhere to sell their produce. Lots and lots of jobs depend on our trade it's with the European as if, Union. It's almost as if, that with the rise of Euroscepticism and with the whole thing crashing around our ears, that you guys are reverting to fear. And you're saying, look, unless we're members of a political club, we can't do business. Do you know, I was in Switzerland. I was at the Swiss Economic Forum. On Friday, uh, there is a relatively small country in terms of numbers of people, uh, relatively big country in terms of the you know, GDP per capita, but Swiss businesses have exactly the same terms of trade with the EU that we do without being members. Indeed, there are something now like 60 countries around the world who have free trade deals with the EU. You know, yes. the old days, the old days of tariff barriers, the arguments for a common market, which were good arguments in the 60s and 70s, have disappeared with global well, trade liberalisation. Let's, let's take Switzerland.
Switzerland or disagree. Norway. Because Let's very take good Switzerland. Example, I'd like very to hear your point of view on that. Neither Switzerland or Norway, who both trade in the single market, have any say over the rules that are made in the single market, and yet those rules apply to them. The Swiss aren't members of the single market. Uh, no, no, they're not members of the single no. market, but they trade with the single market. Well, we trade with America. We have no well, say over no laws made in America, more do we? the Norwegians and the Swiss, as you know, <coughs> particularly the Norwegians, have to pay into the European Union Solidarity Fund in order for the privilege of trading in do Europe. Know, do you know how much you they know, pay compared yes, to us? Yes, Norway, Norwegians pay £110 each a year. Do you know how much the Brits pay? Every, they pay yes. £66 no, each no, a no, year. No, 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 this is a completely And that figure. is the net we figure. That's 50, the net figure. £51 million pounds no, a day. The net is Figure, our current 66, the Norwegians the pay Union. more per head and do you know for what the, the benefit Norwegians of got? trading with the European fish. Union, and they don't even have a say you know, in the rules. The Norwegians the of the have 100% of their fish. You represent the South West, which was a big fishing constituency, where our fishermen are allowed to catch in our territorial waters 18% of the fish there. Our How good a deal is that? Traditionally How good a deal is that? Over How good a deal is that? You, since you've been an MEP, we've seen the destruction of the fishing industry in the South West because we're part of a uh, the wrong now, club. I'd like to interrupt you for a bit because this program is co-produced in partnership with the Robert Schumann Foundation, a leading think tank on Europe. Its president, Jean-Dominique Giuliani, had a question to both of you. Mr. Farage has declared at the European Parliament on May 22nd to face the crisis, I quote, we must provide people with hope. What a program! Everybody could agree with that goal, but how to do this? With the British medicine? With uh, indebtedness? Printing money? With a huge public deficit? With a rising unemployment due to a freer labor market? Do you believe this kind of medicine could apply to the whole European Union? Mr. Farage, this yeah. is a question because the feeling from Paris is that Britain, British Eurosceptics are always allergic to a regulation. Uh, you're against the tax on financial transactions. Uh, you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Cameron refused to sign the, uh, uh, the fiscal uh, treaty. Do you really believe that what Mr. Giuliani called the British medicine is, is really the way forward? Well, I didn't offer that. And, you know, and his question is completely misdirected. He quoted me from a speech in this Parliament last month when I said that increasingly in, in countries like Greece, people are without hope. And he asked me what was the remedy. Well, I'll tell you what the remedy is. The remedy in Greece is to say to people, actually, when you get the drachma back, several things will happen you will firstly become competitive. Secondly, investment will flood into Greece because it's queuing up and waiting for value. Thirdly, hopefully, you'll start to get industry but manufacturing things again because importing things is going to be damned expensive. But at least you'll be back in control of your own country. That will country. cost Greece so much money, at least that's what experts say. Well, I tell you say. what's happening to them now. They're trapped. They're trapped inside an economic prison where, frankly, how they vote next Sunday is irrelevant. They're run by three foreign bureaucrats. How humiliating is that? <laughs> Mr. Watson, I, I know you don't agree with that at no, all. No, I don't agree with that because the Greeks will vote for a government and that government will decide what they want to do. It might decide they want to stay in the euro. It might decide they don't want to Most stay in the euro. Most of them have signed up already if for the memorandum. They want to, if they want to stay in the euro, then they will have to observe the disciplines that are necessary to stay in the euro. And if they don't, well, there'll be a big trouble. But... I disagree entirely with what you're saying, this is entirely Greece's affair, because if Greece defaults, then it is not only Greece that is going to be in difficulty for the next 20 years, it's quite possibly also the United Kingdom and France and Germany, all of whom have banks with substantial exposures to Greece. There's one minute left, please. I'd okay. like to ask each of you to make a clear point, one minute each. Why do you think Britain should leave the EU, why do you think Britain has to stay in the EU? We'll start with you, Mr. Farage. I want to live and work and trade in a Europe where we're friends together, where we cooperate together, we do business, we have sensible reciprocal arrangements, but we actually make our own laws in our own parliaments, in our own country, and from our perspective, we're free to start pursuing a global future because that's where the future action is going to be. Mr. And I want to live in a country that works together with its neighbours through the European Union to achieve a lot of good in the world, far more than it could achieve on its own. There are only 60 million or so Brits. We are 500 million Europeans altogether, and we have a say in the world. And if we want to promote our values across the world 
and to defend our interests in a difficult and sometimes dangerous world when you're up against internationally organized criminal gangs, very powerful, when you're dealing with the threat of climate change and the challenge of energy security, when you're dealing with a rapidly growing world population and more and more pressure for migration, frankly, we are much, much stronger together. Thank you very much, Mr. Farage and Mr. Watson, for agreeing to talk to us.